have you uh, in the house or those of you who are watching online. Now, we're in this uh, rather fun preaching series. Uh, Next week is the final part of this five-part preaching series entitled, I Can't Believe That Jesus Said That. And what we're doing is we're looking at some of the challenging, some of the radical, some of the controversial and really quite inconvenient things that Jesus said during his ministry. If we are a Christian, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, uh, then we're called to follow Christ. We're called to put into practice uh, the words and the teachings of Jesus So we're not going to gag or ignore or be selective about some of the things that Jesus said. We want to listen to what Jesus said. So the format today is slightly different. So I'm going to preach a message, which you're going to hear in a moment. But during the message, you get the opportunity to take up your phone and text in any questions on the subject of the preach. Uh, The the number will be on the next PowerPoint. You'll see it in a minute. Uh, And you can at any time during the preach text in a question on the topic that I am preaching on. And at the end, we'll put up a selection of those questions that people texted in, uh, and we'll have a go at answering them. Uh, You can text in at any time. Uh, It's a church phone, and none of the numbers will be stored. Then at the end of that time, that interactive time, we're going to get the worship team up again, and we will worship and respond. And over the last three weeks, we've looked at what Jesus had to say about forgiveness. We've looked at what Jesus had to say about church family uh, and, and our family and the spiritual family, the church we're part of. And we've also looked at the whole issue of worry and anxiety. Okay, 20 or 30 years ago, to access any type of pornography required huge effort and embarrassment. I mean, you had to go to the top shelf of a newsagent. It was a shady kind of video rental store or some kind of shop in Soho. Today, on our smartphones, you can access pornography in two easy clicks. You can be watching it from the palm of your hand within a moment. And pornography is big business. Now, these stats are a couple of years old, but I think, if anything, they've increased. So in America, this is an American stat, but in America, the population of America spends more money each year on pornography than country music, rock music, classical music, plays, and ballet combined. And it's interesting, it's actually been in our news in this country very recently, because last month in June, there was a a Tiverton by-election. And that by-election was triggered because Neil Parrish, the conservative MP, resigned because he was caught watching pornography in Parliament. Let me give you... uh, a YouGov report that came out just at the beginning of this month. 76% of men and 53% of women said that at some stage in the past year, they had watched pornography. And around one third of men, 36%, said that they watched it at least once a week. So the reality is that pornography has a devastating impact on individuals and relationships. This is a huge issue. And let me just start off by just giving you five very brief ways in which pornography can impact our lives and our relationships. Firstly, pornography is highly addictive. So doctors have done studies, studies around the impact of regularly addictions to pornography, and they have shown that it has a very similar effect on your brain to being a heroin addict. So a a porn addict's brain looks very much like that of a drug addict. 
Dr. Jennings, who's a kind of expert on this field, said, the repetitive activity programs your mind and your actions and your life in a certain way. You basically become bonded to what you watch. You have then a lifetime of bondage to something that you are addicted to. So that's the first way that pornography can have a devastating impact on our lives. Second way, pornography can impact or impair your ability to connect with a real-life human being, a real-life husband or wife. Basically, it disconnects you from real humans because you live in a fantasy world. 58% of those in a study who regularly watch porn struggled with sexual intimacy with their partner. Third way that pornography can impact us individually and in our relationships, pornography can kill marriages. It can be the equivalent to an extramarital affair. It can lead to feelings of anger, of hurt, and betrayal. Is, is my, is my, am I as the spouse not enough? Do they have to go searching somewhere else? And 56% of divorces stated porn as a contributing factor. Fourthly, pornography can have a devastating impact because it means you're more likely to cheat upon your spouse. It messes with your perception of reality. Porn means you're, you're less satisfied and attached to your partner, your spouse, and you're less interested in real life relationships. There's this perception that there are many others out there, alternatives out there that can be reached and so often leads to people cheating or having affairs. And fifthly, pornography leads to feelings of shame and isolation. And this is massive. You see, all temptations, whatever type of temptations, all temptations, they promise you everything and they give you absolutely nothing. You see, pornography has this high euphoric moment, but that then leads to shame and isolation. And it's why pornography is such a hidden problem that is rarely talked about. It's why marriages and ministries and families and futures can be left in ruins. It's why all around us people can be walking around with addictions, with betrayal, with trauma, with, with isolation and shame. Now, let me just say straight up, many of you might say, well, Mark, I I've never seen any pornography. I've never seen it. Brilliant. But as a church, we have a mandate to preach the good news to all people and to acknowledge that this is a huge issue in our culture and in our society today. And actually, there are some good things that are starting to happen. Mainstream companies are calling for the world's biggest porn sites to be better regulated, for there to be age verification laws. Uh, they're being debated and hopefully being put into law that, that companies are being held account on issues of consent and violence towards women. There's some good things that are starting to happen around this issue. But as a church, we can sometimes struggle to talk about it. But as a church, we are in a unique position because as a church, we want to meet people where they are at. We want to welcome people and accept people without shame and without judgment and to tell them that in Christ, you can be free of any addiction or any of the impact that pornography or related factors might have had upon your life. Now, you might be thinking, well, Mark, thanks for that introduction. <laughs> Came to church on a Sunday morning, and thanks for that introduction about pornography. But you might be thinking, okay, you said all of that, but Jesus didn't talk about that, did he? Jesus didn't talk about pornography or lust. You're wrong. Jesus did. Jesus did talk about this very subject. He talked about it because he knew that it was an area of a spiritual stronghold. He knew and he talked about it because he knows that the devil 
uses shame and condemnation to keep people far from him. And one of the biggest tools in the church and in the world today that the devil uses is the tool of pornography and the related shame and the related condemnation, which keeps people from Christ Jesus. Jesus talked about it because he came to set us free. He came to set us free from all addictions. He came to forgive us and wash us clean from all we may have done in our past. So let's look at some scripture. Let's look at what Jesus did have to say in Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to read verses 27 to 30. This is Jesus talking, not me. This is Jesus. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Jesus' words. Jesus is saying, you see, that our whole life matters to him. It's not just what we do, it's what we think. It's what we do with our eyes. It's what we do with our hands. God is interested in everything. Verse 27, verse 28, Jesus starts by saying there that all of us have fallen short when it comes to being sexual sinners. We've fallen short of the high standard that God sets. It doesn't matter, you see, if you haven't actually physically broken the seventh commandment, which says, do not have adultery. You see, if we're honest, all of us have looked lustfully at another man or woman. We've committed adultery in our hearts. We, we've all fallen short of God's standards, and we've rebelled against him. And what Jesus is doing here in the Sermon on the Mount is he is redefining holiness. He, he's saying it's not just about your physical actions. It is about your thoughts as well. And most of us have just not turned our sinful thoughts into sinful actions. That's the difference. We've not turned those, those lustful thoughts into that physical act or that affair. But most of us will have, at times, let our, lie, our eyes linger too long. We will have fantasized about this, that, or the other. We would have let an emotional attachment grow. And Jesus continues this honest talk in verse 29 and verse 30 by saying very starkly, if you are lusting with your eyes, or if you are sinning with your right hand, then cut them off. There needs to be some radical action that takes place. And you see, the culture says, oh, it's a normal part of life. But Jesus says, take this seriously. It's better for you that you gouge out your eye, that you cut off your hand. Now, remember, again, this is Jesus talking and not me. And Jesus is talking about things that most Christians and also most churches avoid. And it's crazy when we have a sex crazed world out there and a church that can be embarrassed, ignore, or turn a blind eye to so much of what is going on. Now, what I'm going to do and how I'm going to tackle it is this I'm going to look at five things, five practical things that we can learn from Jesus around this topic. With the background of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, I want to look at five practical things that we can learn from Jesus. Number one, Jesus was a man. 
Many of you might be sitting there thinking, who does Jesus think he is? How can he talk about this? Gouging out your eye, cutting off your hand. You know, how can he talk like that? Don't you know how difficult it is? Don't you know the temptation? Don't you know? Jesus was a single man. In his culture, that was highly unusual to be in his early 30s and still single. Jesus was tempted in every way, yet resisted temptation. Look at Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 15. Look at this incredible scripture. For we do not have a high priest, that's Jesus, who is unable to emphasize, understand our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet did not sin. There we have it. Jesus was tempted. Jesus would have been tempted in this area of lust. He would have been tempted. The difference to us is Jesus did not sin. He didn't sin. And so Jesus doesn't talk about lust and pornography without understanding the struggles and the temptations that many of us face. I mean, put it like this, Jesus was a red-blooded male in his early 30s, growing up as a teenager, growing up in his 20s, growing up as an early 30s man. He was a red-blooded male, but he was sexually sinless, a sexually sinless virgin. And Jesus came to set us free. So that's the first thing. Jesus was a man. Jesus understands. Second thing, Jesus is God. Many of you might think, who is Jesus to talk about sexual sin? Well, you see, Jesus created sex. He gave it to us as a precious gift to enjoy in the sanctity of marriage. God gave sex to draw husband and wives together in intimacy. But anything that involves lust for another tears people apart. Listen to this quote from a feminist author. Feminist author, Naomi Wolf. She's not Christian, but this is what she said. In the end... Porn doesn't whet men's appetite. It turns them off the real thing. Young women are worrying that as mere flesh and blood, they can scarcely get, let alone hold, their attention. Jesus is passionate about marriage. And he points out that lust and pornography, it, it leaves someone frustrated in their marriage instead of delighting in their husband or their wife. Jesus is God. Jesus knows best. Third thing that Jesus can teach us around this topic. Jesus is the sacrifice for your sin. Jesus died on the cross to deal with all of our sin, all of our mess, all of the things that we have done wrong. So that means that Jesus deals with all sexual sin on the cross. He deals with adulterers, porn addicts, those who are, who are terrible flirts. He, he, he deals with each and every one of us. Romans 8 and verse 1 says, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And this is really important, really important on all levels, but particularly when you start talking about sexual sin. Jesus never said, sort your life out over there and then come to me. He never said that. He always says to each and every one of us, whatever we may have done, whatever mistakes we have made, whatever may have happened in our past, he always says, come to me. Come to me and I will forgive you. Come to me and I will wash away 
your sin. Come to me. You are accepted. You are loved. Come and confess any sexual sin because I will wash it away. It has been dealt with on the cross once and for all. And and this is the important order, the important process that happens is we, we come to Jesus with our mess, with our lives, with our regrets, with our wrongdoings. We come to Jesus. He forgives us. He washes us clean. And then, and only then, does he say, right, take my hand, Mark. Let's walk together and walk this out and walk this through. The order is so Important because the devil will speak a voice into your ear which says, You can't come to Jesus, Mark. You can't come to Jesus, you sinful, dirty, lustful man. You can't come to Jesus. If people knew what you did, if people knew you can't come to Jesus, that's the voice that we so often hear. But it's a voice that is a lie of the enemy. And I think around the area of sexual sin, around the area of pornography is particularly loud. The devil knows and the devil speaks this into our hearts and our minds. And for many of us, it means that we spend so much time in condemnation without receiving the forgiveness and the grace of God. Yes, there can be consequences to sexual sin that we need to work through. Yes, but you are forgiven, you are washed clean, and you are loved, and it doesn't make a difference. On that cross, Jesus died for you. His death forgives all sin. There is no shame, no condemnation. Let the truth of the gospel set you free. Fourth thing, fourth thing. Jesus delivers you from temptation. So Jesus forgives us and he promises to set us free, to set us free from sin. But here's the key. Here's the key that is really important. Jesus sets us free from the power of sin, from lust, from pornography, from sexual sin. He sets us free on the cross from the power of sin. But many of us are not yet free from the habits and the patterns of sexual immorality. The choices that we make are wrong. The choices that we make are unhelpful. We've been set free. We've been set free by the power of the gospel, by what Jesus did on the cross. But we've got to make the right choices. We've got to make some tough, radical choices to fully live free. So, One of the key radical choices that we need to make is, well, what will we look at with our eyes? Matthew 6 and verses 22 to 23 says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. The eye is the lamp of the body. The eye is the doorway to your heart and to your soul. Now, many of us are very careful about what we eat. We go on diets. We're very careful about what we eat or what we don't eat. Brilliant. But we need to be a bit more fussy about what we watch, about what we look at. Because what we look at goes into our hearts. Now, easier than gorging out of our eyes and cutting off our hands is to cut out certain books or magazines or films. 
It is to cut out unhelpful friendships. It is to use filters or software or checks on our internet browser. It is to find accountability with someone of the same sex. It is the ability to turn our eyes and go away from looking at a particular area or particular thing in our lives to kind of bounce off or to close our eyes or to move physically away. We need to be practical and accountable. Now, I just want to chuck up here a website, a really helpful website called uh, The Naked Truth. Uh, And if you just Google it, on there is some brilliant resources some absolutely fantastic resources uh, for stuff you can work through on your own. Uh, You can watch these videos. You can watch materials there. There's a whole load of uh, resources there. You can connect to groups if that's something that particularly you want help with. So go to the Naked Tube. It's a Christian organization, but dealing particularly with the whole area of pornography and lust and being set free from that whole area. There's great resources. There's great programs you can do on your own or in groups. uh, So do check it out. You are set free by the gospel from the power of sin. But all of us need to take responsibility on the choices we then make. The choices of what we watch, the choices of what we do, and where we go, and who we go with. Final thing, final thing that Jesus can teach us and help us in this whole area. Jesus is our deepest source of satisfaction. Whether you are young, whether you are old, whether you are married or whether you are single, the question that many of us ask is, how do I rid my mind of sinful thoughts? The answer is by filling them with pure thoughts of Christ Jesus. That is the answer. Let me read to you a quote which will come up on the screen. This is brilliant. It's by uh, T. Chalmers, who's a 19th century preacher. And uh, this is what he said. Such is the grasping tendency of the human heart that it must have something to lay hold of. The only way to dispossess it of an old affection is by the explosive power of a new one. Isn't that good? The only way to dispossess your heart of an old affection of sinful lusts and sinful desires is by the explosive power of a new one, of Jesus Christ. You see, lust and pornography will fill the void unless you fill it with something else. And this is where many of us get it wrong. You see, you you, you mess up. You watch something, you mess up, you lustfully mess up. And then you go to Jesus and you ask him for forgiveness and he washes you clean and you are forgiven and you are loved and you are set free. But then your mind is just empty. You haven't put anything in there. You're not thinking about anything else in particular. You're just going about your day. And if you're not careful, what happens is within hours or within days, the lustful thoughts are back, the the, the temptations are back, and you go round and round and round and round and round in a circle. You need to replace. You need to feed your heart on Jesus Christ. You need to feed your heart on what is good, on what is right, on what is righteous. You need to let your heart just encounter the explosive goodness of the grace of God. And lust 
and pornography and any other sin cannot live in a heart that is fully captivated by Jesus. The answer ultimately to this whole challenge of lust and pornography is more of Jesus in your life. That is ultimately the answer. There are practical things you may need to do. There are practical strategies to put into place. There are radical choices you might need to make. But bottom line, it is by saying, no, Jesus is my greatest satisfaction. Whether I am single, whether I am married, whether my marriage is going great, whether my marriage is on the rocks, whatever stage of life I might be in, let Jesus be the one. Let Jesus be the one who captivates your heart. So, let's be concluding before the questions. Why did I think about doing this? But anyway, um, conclusion. Don't be surprised that Jesus talks about lust and pornography. He's interested in your whole life. Don't be surprised. And in Jesus Christ, there is no shame. There is forgiveness, but there is no shame or condemnation. That is a lie of the enemy. Jesus comes to set us free. He wants us to be free from addictions, whether that's being addicted to alcohol, whether that's being addicted to pornography, whether that's being addicted to a negative way of thinking, whatever it is, Jesus came to set us free And he wants then to teach us, hand in hand, the path to sexual purity. So, hopefully, I'm sure that generated some questions, which we'll look at in a moment. They'll come up on the screen. And then six or seven questions to come up to have a sip of juice. And then, just to give you one quick heads up before the question comes up, what we're going to do is we're going to worship. We're going to spend a bit of time, a bit longer than normal, at the end of the meeting, worshipping. Because to respond to something like this is is not the easiest. You know, it's not the easiest. It may not be appropriate. You might need to speak to someone that you know. You may need to speak to someone or get some help or, or, or find someone that you can trust. But what happens in worship is that Christ brings freedom in worship. And we can all respond together corporately in worship. So we're going to leave a little bit more time than normal, and we're going to worship. And I'm going to pray that in that context of worship, God would be at work, setting us free, speaking to us, empowering us, and being at work in this area. Okay. Let's do it. So questions will come up on the screen, and I'll do my best with God's help to answer some of them. Go for it when you are ready. Okay, if I spoke to one of the leaders at church about my pornography addiction, how do I know that I would be helped rather than ostracized? Great question, and hopefully the platform will be able to do it anonymously like this is is a good start. I think what I tried to do today by speaking about it kind of as normally as possible, head on, is to try and break one of the biggest taboos around pornography is that it's only one person or it's only kind of like two or three people in the whole church. The reality is, if you look at the statistics, it's the majority of us. Some of it is some of it's, it's, it's a big deal, for some of it's a less, but it's, it's many of us at some season or some stage in our life. The reason why I say that is because I don't think... And I would hope that you wouldn't be ostracized because this is something that many of us, if not all of us, have faced. It's something that many of us, if not all of us, have battled through. It's something that 
many of us, if not all of us, will have some pearls of wisdom to share. And I would want to say to you, whoever you may be, that if that is something that you would come to me or one of the other leaders, there will be grace for you. There will be grace. There will be the ability to say, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But we're not going to let shame come in. We're not going to let condemnation come in. So my promise to you would be, and I think off the back of today, off the back of what I preach, off the back of what we've looked at, I would say that this is something that won't happen because we are all sinners who have fallen short of the glory of God. Okay, next question. Is, not, is pornography not better than some other addictions as it's not affecting anyone else, is it? Yes, that's something I've heard a lot, something that people put forward a lot. And on one hand, you could argue you could argue it, couldn't you? You could argue it strongly. Well, isn't that better than going and having an affair? Isn't that better to go and than doing X or Y or Z? And you could argue that. Yes, you could. But remember some of the things that I outlined at the beginning, some of the devastating impacts that pornography has on your brain, on the patterns of your brain, on your human relationships. If you're married, the impact it will have on your marriage. If you're not Married, the ability to then have uh, relationships or go out with someone or get to a place where you might be married. So you could argue that the immediate impact is not as great. But I think over time, and they're doing more and more medical studies on this in the world, nothing to do with church or Christians, that are more and more showing what a hugely negative impact it has on our brains and the patterns and the thought patterns that we get into as a result of this addiction. So in an element, I, yes, but think of all of the huge damaging effects that pornography has. And the last thing I would say is Jesus wants to set you free. Jesus wants to set you free. He doesn't just want to set you free from, from the big things, like the fact that you go to heaven because you've been set free from the curse of death. He wants to set you free from every addiction. He wants to set you free from every sin and every part of your life that is not as God ordained it in his word. So, so Jesus is interested and he wants to set you free. The, the question I would, I would ask is, you know, do you want to be free? Do you want to be set free? Jesus can set you free. Do you want to be set free? Okay, next one. What if I'm not married or never want to get married? How can pornography then affect my life? I mean, Jesus was, I come back to Jesus. Jesus was a single man. He was a single man. I think that is so helpful. I think that's so important to remember Yes, marriage is a wonderful God-given institution. But Jesus was a single man who did not sin. And, and, I, and I think, you know, there's a beautiful thing to be said for singleness. That, that sometimes the church has got this massively wrong because it goes on about marriage, uh, but it doesn't often glorify and big up being single and the ways that God can use you for the kingdom and, and how Jesus was single and Paul spent the majority of his life, his ministry life, being single. So I think, you know, it's to say and celebrate if that's what God's called you to or you're in a season of life when you are single, fantastic. God bless you. Go and just celebrate all that God has for you. Use the opportunities, the freedom that you have, the time that you have the ability to be uh, and go to different places or to serve diligently, use that. The, th the only thing I would say for pornography is it could just, it could just damage your, your mind. It damages your way of thinking, your way of viewing others. And Jesus wants to set you free. He wants to set you free. Let's go on to the next one. How can I find a spouse if I don't look to see what I like physically? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, okay, I don't know if I'm going to fully answer this one, but all I would say is, you know, 
the whole process of finding a spouse, it's important to say, it's important to say that part of the chemistry in finding a husband or a wife is that there is a physical attraction. You know, God-given physical attraction. You know, the, the, the eros love, the romantic love, the physical attraction is something God-given. The fact of you finding someone with the opposite sex attractive uh, is a good thing. It's a good thing. It's not something to be suppressed because it's a good thing that God has put inside of us. I would say, though, we do that in an honoring way. We do that in a godly way, not by looking at pornography. We do that in a way that, that, that honors the man, that honors the woman, you know, there's a journey we go on when we date someone and, you know, finding out if they're the one to, to marry. So the physical attraction is part of the chemistry, is part of the deal. It's a good thing. But I don't think we, we do that by, by looking at pornography. I think that taints it. And I think that's just not the way that God has ordained and it's not his best for you. Next one. I want to tell my partner that I'm addicted, but I'm afraid they'll leave me. Wow, what should I do? That's a big question. That's a very honest question. I mean, I would suggest two things, but I don't think I'm qualified. I don't feel particularly able to maybe thoroughly answer this one. But I would suggest two things that you could do that would be a helpful start. One would be if there's someone that you trust, a godly member of the same sex. So for me, another guy, if there was someone who you trust, who is a godly kind of man that you could go to and share, that you could talk to and share, I think that would be a good thing to do. I think that website I mentioned, The Naked Truth, there is fantastic resources on there. It's set out by a Christian guy called Ian Henderson who I remember in my youth was a brilliant preacher. He's a couple of years older than me. He was a great preacher. God called him. There's a whole story on the website. God called him. It's something he, he says he kind of didn't want to do, but God called him to provide resources and to go around the country preaching about pornography and the impact that it has. So on that website, there are lots of resources and things that you can do that are really helpful, both on an individual level and on a group that, that you could be a part of. So I would say they're helpful things that you can do. But ultimately, if you want to be in a place where your marriage is in a place of honesty and transparency, then at some point, then there will be the difficult conversation of talking and grappling with that issue. I think it's something that you can prepare for, that you can get some resources for, that you can battle with. But ultimately, you know, if you want to live free, if you want to live in, in a relationship that is deep, a relationship that is fully trustworthy on both sides, there will come a point when you, that is something that you will need to talk about and address. So, yeah, I feel a bit underqualified to talk about that one, but I think that is what I would say, seek some godly wisdom, get some resources, but ultimately, in a marriage where you want the trust and you want the, 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 you know, the mutual kind of uh, trust for one another, there comes a point where that needs to be talked about and shared with your partner. Okay, next one. How many more we got? Three more? Three more. Okay. I'm no longer attracted to my spouse, but pornography stops me from cheating. <laughs> How is this wrong? I mean, that's a very honest question. It's a very real question. I would say, though, it's not God's best. It's not what God wants for you, which is ultimately the best thing, which is a loving, respectful, fulfilling marriage. Um, I mean, there's huge amounts there to kind of unpack. Marriage counseling is something that's very good that you could get, that would be very helpful. Um, yes, you don't want to cheat, 
but ultimately you're not living the best that God has for you. I mean, I think, again, I would say, if that's a marriage that, that, that people are in, seek some help. Seek some help. Seek marriage counseling. You know, seek to invest in your marriage and then take it from there. Next one. Society says that pornography is healthy, even self-caring. How do I, as a Christian, find alternative ways to care for myself sexually? Okay, that's a good question, a very good question. Again, I would say that society has a particular way of looking at things. It's very interesting that in a society that is pro-pornography and, and, and a society that talks it up a lot, that an MP gets hounded out of parliament for watching some on his tablet, on his phone. It, it, it's, it's very interesting. Um, but I would say that as a Christian, Jesus understands our struggles. Jesus understands our temptations. And they are something that we are to work through and look for victory in Jesus Christ. And it's hard, it's challenging, but there is grace, there is forgiveness, and there is, remember what I said, the last thing, there is the key part of the jigsaw, which is to find in Christ the ultimate satisfaction. To find in Christ the, the longing that we sometimes feel in our hearts and in our beings. So I don't know if I'm answering that fully, but I would say again, Jesus says there's a better way. Jesus understands. And Jesus says, in me, you will find fulfillment. You will find full fulfillment in me. Let's go on to the next one. Is this the last one? Or was there two more? Last one. Okay. How do we control our thoughts when it comes to lust? It often feels like we have no control over what enters our mind in a world bombarded with sex. Yes, this is what I was talking about when it comes to we are free from sin, but we have to take responsibility and make radical choices with what we watch and what enters our minds. We have to be better gatekeepers of our eyes, our minds, and our hearts. And I think sometimes Christians can be a bit laxatical and just kind of, yeah, well, it doesn't matter what we watch or what happens or what here. And then because of that, we find our mind is swimming with all kinds of thoughts. We find our mind is swimming with all kinds of temptations and all kinds of lusts. That's why Jesus was talking in this hyperbolic language, gouge out your eye, cut off your hand. He's making a point. That's what he's doing. He's making a point that you've got to be radical, that you've got to make difficult, radical decisions. You've got to put the filter on your internet search. You've got to kind of turn off and make it so that your TV can't go to certain stations. You've got to have an accountability relationship with someone who trusts you. You've got to do some of these things to make the radical choices needed to live holy and pure in a sex-crazed world. Okay? You, with God's help, and your participation, you can do it. You can see victory in Christ Jesus. But it takes hard work. It takes difficult decisions. And you have to break. Sometimes you are breaking a habit that has formed over 10 years. You see, the habit has been there for 10 years of your life. And you've got to break it. And sometimes that's a gradual process. It takes time to break that. And you might think, I'm doing really well. I've had a great two weeks. And then, bam, and you go backwards. But you have to know, no, but I've taken ground. I'm further forward than I was. So I go again with God's grace, with God's power, and with God's strength. And I'll say it again. It's the last thing before we worship. You've got to understand that Satan 
has used this whole area of lust and pornography as a kind of controlling vice over many in the church. Because he's used it as the ability to say there is shame, there is condemnation, there is shame, there is condemnation. And Jesus says there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. It is a battle. These things are a battle. Okay, and we often take two steps forward and then we take one step back. We take two steps forward, one step back. That's often how it feels. But listen, in our battles, in our struggles, there is no condemnation. Jesus' love for you is immense. He loves you. He forgives you. He just wants to wrap his arms around you. He wants you to know that you are loved. He wants you to know that he can set you free. He wants you to know that he is the one who will satisfy your deepest desires. Jesus, Jesus is the one. Jesus is the one. It is a battle. It is a sex-crazed world. But with God's help, with God's help, we can do it. We can take ground. We can overcome. It might take time. For many of us, it won't be a quick fix. For many of us, it's something we battle with over many years, something that we might battle with. And sometimes it might never fully go away. But with God's help, And with God's power and making radical choices, we can live the life, the pure life, the best life that God has for each and every one of us. Okay, let's stand. Adama, Dione, could you come up? We are going to respond through worship. Like I said, This is not the time or the place to come forward. And this is a time and a place to worship. This is a time and a place to come before the Lord and know that his grace saves us. His grace washes us clean. His grace changes us from the inside out.